Let me begin with the blessing over the Torah. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kedeshanu b'mitzvotav v'sivanu la'asok b'defei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through his commandments and commanded us to engage in study of the words of Torah. All right. So this week we begin another Torah portion. And this week's Torah portion is the Torah portion, Torah portion of Noah. It spans Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, all the way through the end of chapter 11. And it's a story that's very familiar with us. As children, we grew up reading about Noah's Ark. We grew up reading about the Tower of Babel. And these are stories that are very familiar to us. And today I would like to dig deeper into the surface of this familiar story and to look at what it means for us in the coming days, the coming days in Noah. And also I want to look at how this Torah portion, if you overlay it with last week's Torah portion, how they match up and how it's prophetic for each and every one of us. So starting off in Genesis 6-9, the beginning of this Torah portion. This is the line of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his age. Basically, he was perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And I want to break down this verse to talk about, kind of to give you an idea of the character of Noah. And the way I'm going to do it is, I am going to use a few rabbinic sources, but I'm going to ultimately show you how those sources are backed up with Scripture. So, let's look at Noah was, so if we have up here, we have, I have my dot, Noah. These are the generations of Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah Isadik was a righteous man. Tamim uh, He was blameless in his generation. So let's look at that. Tamim So Rashi says, and Rashi was one of the rabbis. He says some of our rabbis explain that he was righteous even in his generation. It follows he lived in a gen- if he lived in a generation of righteous people, he would have been even more righteous. So when it talks about him being a righteous man, perfect in his generation, a wicked generation, if he lived in a righteous generation, he would be even more righteous. Um, however, other rabbis explain that in comparison with his generation, that was a wicked generation, He seemed righteous, but had he lived in the generation of Abraham, he would have been of no consequence. Let me break this down. The idea is, so the first thought over here is, Noah was a really righteous man. He had a hard time in the godless society he lived in, and Had he lived in a godly society, a more godly society like the age of Abraham, he would have been even more righteous. He would have been more strong in his walk. Over here is the other idea. And this idea is the idea that the reason why Noah seemed so righteous was because he lived amongst godless people if that makes sense. But if he had lived amongst righteous people, he would have just kind of faded into the shadows because he would have been, nothing, nothing about him would have stood out. He wouldn't be anything special. So keep that in your mind. I also want to look at Genesis 6-9 where it says, Et ha helochim hithalek noach. Basically, those four words in Hebrew mean with 
Elohim Noah walked. And going to the Midrash Rabbah, it says, God walked with Noah. Um, basically, it's like a parable of two sons for a chief or a king or a ruler. There, the ruler had one son who was a big son who was older, and then he had another son who was smaller. And the idea is he lets the older son walk on ahead because he knows the older son can take care of himself. But he, lets the, he makes the younger son walk with him because he doesn't trust that that younger son won't get hurt. He wants to keep the child close to him, to keep the child safe. And when it says... God walked with Noah in Genesis 6, verse 9. What it's saying is that's an idea of Noah's character. He wasn't strong enough to go out and walk on his own, so he needed to stay close to God. So, I generally like, I always like to have Scripture as my final authority. And this is where the rabbis got their opinion about the character of Moses, Noah. It says, with God, Noah walked. That is Genesis 6, 9, right? Et ha Elohim, et, that's with Elohim, hit halech, walked Noah. We go to Genesis 24, verse 40, we're talking about Abraham. And Abraham's servant is saying, recalling to Remember how Abraham's servant was sent to the land of Padam Aram to find a wife for Isaac. Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac. And the servant says to Rebekah's parents, Vayomer Alai, my master, said to me, Adonai is sherkit halekti lifnav. Adonai is the one I walked before. See, lifnav means he walked before. Abraham was able to walk ahead. Et means, as with Noah, means Noah walked side by side with God. But Abraham was able to go on ahead. So, I just threw at you guys a bunch of information that seems random. The question is, how does it apply to you? And it's found in last week's Torah portion, the last verse, Genesis 6, 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Because no one wasn't anyone special. It wasn't because of his own righteousness. Righteousness really means right standing. It wasn't because he did anything to be in right standing with God. It was because he was tamim, he was wholehearted with God. And God was able to take that and use that. And that's how we found grace with God. The word chen, grace in the Hebrew means that's favor you earn from someone. You don't, that's favor you get from someone. You don't earn that. That's not something you can earn. And so in Matthew 24, it tells us that the last days will be like the days in Noah. And that's talking about us. And as people in the days of Noah who want to make it through, we are no one special. Because had we lived in the age of Moses, of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and Joshua and the generations that conquered the land of Canaan, we would be no one special. These are men that understood the Torah way more than us, that lived it far better than we do. But because we live in a godless world, we're called to stand out from that and be righteous in comparison to that and do our best to follow Torah and follow God with our whole heart. Also, we are called not only to walk with God, but to also Take that walk and reach others and walk ahead. So keeping that in mind, the story of Noah versus Abraham is a story of the earth being recreated. Noah was born in a pre-flood world. 
Abraham was born in a post-flood world. And the reason why I have Abraham up there is because last week's Torah portion, which was the creation of the world, ended with Noah. This week's Torah portion, which is the second creation of the world, ends with Abraham. And it shows, these two men show the difference between these two ages. Noah represents the pre-world because he was born in the pre-world. Abraham represents the post-world. The pre-flood world shows, was a world that was dependent on God for strength, for righteous living. The post-flood world is where some independence is required. God kind of has to take a step back, not in a bad way, but so that you can go forward. Because the second creation was about making a way for repentance. Because the first creation was created with Adam, a sinless flawless human being at the time. He did not have a desire to do evil. He did not know evil. And that world was created for perfect human beings who had never sinned before. But this world that God created after the flood was made for people to not necessarily to condone sin, but to be more merciful that way they can turn from their sin and come back. If that makes sense. So what was the root cause of the flood that caused this second creation story? The earth became corrupt before God and the earth was filled with lawlessness. And I want you to focus on that last word, lawlessness. And it's Hamas. And it means violence. And it's kind of, if you wonder why the terrorist group Hamas is named Hamas, that's literally what that means, if you take the Arabic that relates to the Hebrew. But just keeping that in mind. Robbery and violence. It says, Vadishchet ha'aretz lifne. And the Vadishchet is a term for corruption, a corruption that comes from idolatry. And we get that in the Torah when it says, Pentashchitun, lest you act wickedly in your hearts go astray, and you basically make a sculptured image, and you commit adultery. And Hamas itself means violence. So where do the pieces fit together? With our sin, we become corrupt. Varishchet. It's like all of us have an idol, and I'm learning in my week, this week, it's been a little rough because I've been learning about idols in my life. And the t- thing is, the inward state that comes from the corruption of the idol worship, whatever form it is for you, you think it only affects you. And the violence comes in when your actions start hurting others. You realize that your own selfishness blinds you to the fact that your neighbor hasn't a need. And that is the violence. And the world, the pre-flood world, had grown to the point where they had their hidden sins. And their hidden sins led to open sins. It started out as a straying from God, and it turned to a violence and a hurting of others. So, I want to look at the earth being filled up with this violence, and I want to, I want to look at it from a grammatical perspective. It says, Varishchet ha'aretz lifnei ha'elohim v'timalei ha'aretz chamas. And I want you to focus on this word, Varimale, Vatimale was filled up. This is Genesis 6:11. The earth was filled up with violence. It was being filled up. And down here in verse 13 it says has come to us the end of all flesh for the earth has been filled up with violence. 
In verse 11, it's just talking about the state of the world. In verse 13, we are told that Noah is told to build an ark. And the idea of this filling up with violence is in the first verse, it is in the imperfect tense. And then the second one, Genesis 6.13, it's in the perfect tense. What is the difference between the imperfect and perfect tense in Hebrew or any language in grammar? Imperfect tense is, I am putting... I am putting this object on here. I am putting. It's an incomplete action. It's an incomplete action. That's imperfect tense. It's, it's imperfect. The action has not been made perfect. I'm still in the process of doing it. In Genesis 6.11, the earth was being filled up with violence. That's, it still was being filled up. You go to Genesis 6.13, when God says, it's finished, build the ark, I'm sending the flood. The earth was filled up, it reached its max point. And the point is, if you overlay Genesis 1 through 6, the first week's Torah portion with this week's Torah portion, it begins with tohu vavohu, which is utter chaos. And this week's Torah portion begins with utter chaos too, the earth being filled with violence. And it's com now completely filled up. So, what does God do? He sends a flood. He recreates the world. And I won't do this for you today, but I encourage you to go back and reread. And notice how it adds up. After the flood ceases, a wind blows over the waters and dries the ground. And the ark settles on the mountain. And the waters above, which is the rain, and the waters below from the fountains of the deep are separated. Sound like Genesis 1. And then the dove brings an olive branch. On day three, there's plants. And then God tells the people who come out of the ark, he says, I have placed a fear in you amongst all the animals a fear of you in all the animals. The animals are scared in, of you because they respect you. And then you go back to Genesis 1, it says, rule the earth, rule over all the animals. And you follow the same structure and Noah falls in, by drinking of the fruit of the vine, just like Adam fell. And then the whole world descends into chaos through the Tower of the Babel, just like the whole world descended in Genesis um, 1 through 6. And it's a recreation story. And the point is, like I said, and I'm going to drill this in. The second world was created f with the understanding that people were imperfect. The flood happened to recreate the world with the understanding that we are imperfect, that we need a way back. That's why the second world was created. This is... Um, it's not a second world, but it's, if I explain it, this is why there was a second creation story. And it says, Noah built, when Noah came off the ark, it says, Noah built an altar, offered every pure animal and every pure bird. And God responds and he says, Never again will I doom the earth because of mankind, since the devisings of the human mind are evil from youth. Nor will I ever again destroy every living being as I have done. And I want to look at this from a certain perspective. When it says, I will never again destroy the world, because the devisings of the human heart are evil from youth. So this word, from a cantor's perspective, so someone who would get up in a synagogue and read this, what they would see is they would see musical melodies written on the Torah. We talked about this last week. The Torah has musical melodies written into it. And that would elucidate the meaning of the passage better for them. And where we get these musical melodies is 
when they came back from the Babylonian captivity, I just learned this, when Ezra created the block letter system for Hebrew that we have now today, he also created the musical melodies that match the tone of the passage. And in here, wherein God says, I will never again destroy the earth, I will never again curse the ground, remember the curse of Adam, I will cur cursed is the ground for your sake, remember that? He says, I'll never do that again. Why? Ki yetzer, ki yetzer, lev ha adam ra min because the human mind is evil from his youth. And I want to look at Lev Ha Adam right here, the heart of man. That is, this is the thing that is evil from its youth. The idea is, the, it's, it's built with the idea that the reason why I am kind of moving these restrictions is, it's man's in an unfair position here, if that makes sense. He needs a way back. He needs a way back, and he can't reach God because he has a sinful heart. He can't come back to God because his heart is sinful. And the lev, under the lev, the vowel, the musical note is called the darga. And under man, ha'adam, it's called the tevir. Lev ha'adam. That's the melody. The idea is it's a broken staircase. That's what those musical notes mean. If you go to the story of Jacob having the dream of the ladder in the heavens and the earth, and God's at the top of the ladder, and you're at the bottom of the ladder trying to reach, the Darga Tevir tells you, that you can't reach God because the ladder's been broken. So, we go to the Haftarah to find how to restore the, how this ladder is restored. In the Haftarah, it talks about, I won't read through it all for you. If you want to read the Haftarah, it's Isaiah 40, 54, 1 through Isaiah 55, verse 5. And it basically is talking about Israel as a widow. A, not necessarily a widow, but a woman who's been put away from her husband. And God misses his wife. The widow misses her husband. And it's about a restoring of the two. And up there I have the highlighted points, but for lack of time, I won't go into the details. It talks about a covenant being restored. And that's kind of the same language used in this week's Torah portion. For those of you who don't know, the Haftarah is the prophet readings that go along with the Torah portion, by the way. It's kind of interesting that when you look at the story of the ark, while they were on the ark, the husbands and the wives were kept separate. And how do we know this? We can look at the Hebrew. Remember last week how I told you the white space on the page, the order of the letters, the number values of the letters themselves, everything has meaning. In Genesis 6.18, it says, I will establish my covenant with you. You shall enter the ark with your son. So, ata, it says, uvata, that is, you shall enter, elchatava, hateva, ata, that is you, Uvenecha, you and your sons. Veishtecha, unsher vanecha. That is your wife and the wives of your sons. Notice that the ata, that is you, Noah, and your wife are separate. The sons come in between, right? Then you have the banecha, the uvanecha, your sons, and their wives, but in between them is Noah's wife. And the idea is the couples are split. And it's for a reason, because if you go to the half Torah, you read about the widow and the husband and wife who are separated. 
But it's kind of interesting. Once they come out of the ark, once they come into this new world, there's this promise of a restoration because it says, come out of the ark together with your wife, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives. And they're together now. And the idea here is, on a deeper level, each of us has that broken staircase, right? That broken ladder. And it's cut off. But with the second creation of the world, there's a promise at the end of it of Abraham. Abraham's going to have a son one day named Isaac. And Isaac will have a son named Jacob. And Jacob's going to have 12 sons. And they're going to be awesome. And one of those sons will be Judah. And from Judah, the Messiah will come. And he will give his life for us. And the idea is that staircase will be repaired. As we close, before we go into discussion... I want to talk about the month that we are in. The month that we are in is the month of Mabul. That is if you go by the ancient biblical name for it, but it's also known as Cheshvan in the Hebrew. And I talked a little bit about this over Sukkot, and the idea is this is a month where we feel like we are disconnected in many ways from God because we're thrust out into the real, real world after Sukkot. The idea is we hold to the promise that things in our lives are being recreated. There are going to be things in our lives that will be the old ways of thinking before Sukkot that are going to be shaken up. Old patterns of sin, ways of thinking that aren't conducive for our walk. But the purpose of the floods, which ultimately is the Torah of God and the Holy Spirit, the purpose of this season, this little separation, is to understand that actually God is pretty close with us. But there's a way back for us. And a way of healing, a way of redemption in our lives. And also that we are not really supposed that what is being done with us is not something that's just for us alone. It's supposed we are not the old world walked with God. It walked at Ha Elohim with God. Our purpose is not just to walk with God, it's to go out and love others to go before God because that is what caused the first world to sin, to just be destroyed, was because they were so focused on self that they went out and they, their sin hurt others. In this week's Torah portion, we have the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel was a far more open rebellion against God than the pre-flood rebellion. It was more rebellious directed against God. Because the people before the flood were just acting for self. But after the flood, they were openly rebelling against God. And why didn't God destroy them? If you look at what they did, it was the unity that brought them together. The fact that they loved each other, they had one language. That's what brought them together. And what they did was wrong. God, they rebelled against God by not filling the earth. But the message for us is the Abraham that's coming is coming to bring a son who will bring the whole earth back together the right way. 
focused on God, focused on Torah, and living out his ways in his land. So with that said, I would like to open up for discussion. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes? Okay, that's good. I feel like I threw a lot at you guys. It was like a lot of information. They're all speechless. Yeah, one of the um, theological questions um, before Mount Sinai was was the law given, and it's it's apparent that if if Yahweh can declare Noah a righteous man, and we know that 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 God does not change, then there was a standard that Noah was living by that has not changed. Um, so that standard was what was confirmed at Mount Sinai. So when Noah comes out of the ark, he has to offer a clean animal and a clean, he has to offer clean animals and he has to offer clean birds, right? He does that. How did he know what a clean animal was if there was no Torah yet? Because up to that point, if we're just going off of the passage, we don't know. If you even go back to Cain and Abel, how did Abel know what a pleasing offering was? You know, these are questions that ask something that really show that Torah was in effect from the beginning. Next person. So my question is in regard to Nimrod in Genesis 10. He's described as being a mighty hunter before Adonai. And when we were discussing it, my dad came over with the kids. He was describing that that was not a positive thing to be a mighty hunter before God. Could you elaborate on that just a touch, please? Sure. I would like to show how, first of all, two things. Mighty hunter before God does not mean he went out and he shot deer in the field. On a deeper level, that means he went out and he killed men. He was a man of war. He was a man of violence. On an even deeper level, he was a man who used his words to sway the hearts of men. And as a result, killed men. Secondly, I would like to point him back to Lamech and the creation story. So if you think of the six, first six books of the Bible, of last week's Torah portion, and you lay them over, overlay them, you kind of get a central story. This is why I really liked watching Tony Robinson teach over Sukkot. I love the way he does scripture and studies scripture and brings it to light because he shows how you can take two passages and overlay them. Lamech was a murderer. He told his two wives, I murdered, I murdered a man, I killed a young man for wounding me, and all that. And you look at who Nimrod was. And because of the words he used, and that he created the chaos of the Tower of Babel, so to speak. Well, God created it, he confused their languages, but he was the one, the Tower of Babel was in his territory. That's Babylon. So I hope that kind of elucidates that more. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I might have missed this. Could you explain again why it's important to the separation? How do you know they, they were separate, the husband and wives, just by way, the way it's written? Or, and why is that significant? First of all, the, the Hebrew mindset looks at Scripture. It says that every word, every letter, every single white space in the text itself is important. That's the premise you go in. Order of words is important. Order of names is important. And you look at the half Torah. Isaiah 54, 
all the way through 55 verse 5. And it talks about the floods of Noah. It talks about all these things. And, but it also talks about a widow. Can I have my slides up again, are they? So keeping that in mind, keeping all that in mind, we, it's using scripture to interpret scripture is also a big part of it. Right? So we use the first, we get to the conclusion, that conclusion by using the haftar, the prophets, the corresponding half, the corresponding prophet reading. It's about a widow. It's about, it's about a woman who's been separated from her husband, a husband who's been separated from his wife. And so we go to Genesis 6.18 with that lens that the flood is ultimately about that because we just also read the prophet reading. And then with that lens, you notice, hey, wait a minute. A ta is you, that is referring to Noah. It could have been written, you shall enter the ark with you, your wife, your sons, and their wives. But it wasn't written that way. It was written you, your sons, your wife, and the wives of your sons. And the order is, one should have been this, so one, two, three, four, right? Number three, which is your wife should be with you, right? And your son should be with their wives. And so that's the structure you get. You can look at the structure of the verse. Yes? That from, that from Genesis, in the beginning, God wanted all mankind to be with him. True. Right? So that, that's what this is saying, but it's saying that that is not going to happen. They're all going to go away from God. And now he's got to bring them back to him. As, we, as Christians look at the prodigal son story. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. I really like the way you explained that. That was... That was so good. I hope that is that correct. Yeah. And it's the idea is a key important thing is I establish my covenant with you. If I can get this dot. I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. See, as you enter, va, uh, um, if I can find it, uvata, enter, you go in. But when you come out of the whole experience, you will come out restored. That's the idea. Any more questions or comments? more going once all right we have a I'm hoping I'm going to be able to explain this the way I'm asking we are encouraged to stay away from evil Mm -hmm. but yet we're encouraged to love our neighbor so how do you get to the two if your neighbor is evil (laughs) You be different from them. You're different. You are warm and kind and caring to that person, but at the same time, it is very clear that you don't partake. And I believe it's First Peter. My dad used to read this to me and my siblings when we were little. It says they are shocked when you don't roam with them into the same sins. That's basically what. What does it say? It's the idea they, yeah, they're, they're taken aback by the fact that you don't run with them. 
and the wickedness. Uh, well. But yeah, that's kind of the gist of the verse, and that's in First Peter, and that's the idea that you love them, but at the same time, yeah. Yeah, Psalms 1, I think, uh, kind of gives us some insight to how we... Godly is, is, is listening to their, you know, their ways and their mindset and heeding that, um, nor stands in the way of sinners. Um, you know, that word standing is your, your uh, um, what's the word I want to say? You're participating mm -hmm. in the things that they stand for and are doing, and then sitting in the seat of the scornful. So it covers, you know, every aspect of our life, daily life, you know. Yeah. So it's we don't participate in their counsel. We don't participate in standing in what they're doing or sitting, you know, in the seat of the scornful. So it really, it really goes down to, uh, you know, our actions. You know, we're not going to be like them. Like Paul said, uh, he says, you're living in the world. Um, you have to live in the world, but be not of the world. Yeah, part of the blessing of the children of Jacob, Jacob and Abraham's seed and Isaac's seed, is that their seed would be a light to the nations. And each one of us is a part of that seed. And the idea is we go out and we shine our light. And that's the whole idea behind the reason for the second creation. I keep calling it a second creation for a reason. Because when we go out into the world. See, we don't just walk with God. The light just doesn't stay with its source. It goes out, and it shines a light. And it's not conforming, but it's being different. Someone else. <laughs> All right. I, I just want to add, uh, Is it on? To the sister's question, uh, Donnie and I work in an environment uh, where there's a lot of language. And it's grievous, it's, yeah, but we have to be there. And, and I agree that you just have to be different, not from our own inner character and strength, but that we want to be ambassadors for Messiah as scripture exhorts us to and shine that light. It is hard to come down from the mountaintop experience of Sukkot it reminded me when I was a youth going to Christian camp, it was hard going back down the mountain, but you have to go back and you have to engage. And it, it, the, the scriptures were, saw, uh, uh, I think it was Lot, was grieved by what was going on around him. It, it's, a, it's a sharpening experience, and I think it keeps us on our toes to be witnesses for him and... Um, we are to shine that light, so to speak. Um, one other comment I'll, I'll just quickly make in regard to the teaching is I do enjoy Tony Robinson's uh, way of helping us study scripture. Uh, there's no, no coincidences as we, I believe, all agree that his word is the ultimate authority in which we base our lives. And what I see so many correlations and the ark that Noah was instructed to build is, a, is also a symbol of judgment. And 
then you have Abraham's world. Later, uh, Moses, uh, they were instructed to build the Ark of the Covenant. And when you study those two, you can see so many uh, correlations in how the Ark of the Covenant was to, uh, to be covered inside and out with gold. The Ark of Noah was to be covered inside and out with pitch. And, and yet they were both uh, a life-saving means and uh, a means of mercy, whereas the Ark of the Covenant had the mercy seat. In a way, the Ark of Noah, a symbol of judgment, was also a symbol of mercy of God giving mankind a second chance. Sort of the, the ultimate love boat, so to speak. The whole uh, message of scripture is just an expression of God's love. I'm, am, I'm amazed by it when you study it at all various levels. And then one final comment, when you said that man is in an unfair advantage because of our heart's condition. Yeah. And it reminds me of in Psalm 119, there's that verse which says, the, the word you have given me upon which you have made me hope. Yeah. And so I believe that faith is a gift and that I cannot declare that God's word is that ultimate and final authority without him having his spirit revealed that to me. And, I, and I'm so thankful for his love and grace for that. I think, too, that um, in today's society, love is shown like as a hug and always being there for someone. And I think that's true, but it's also a lot more than that. It's giving um, repercussions of your actions because ultimately when you love somebody, it talks about in the Bible, you punish them so that they learn the Torah, they live accordingly, they live righteously because you want to give them life. You want to um, grant them that gift of eternal life with Yahweh, which is everybody's goal, I believe. And so when you correct somebody and you're not always, you know, just kind of being pushed over and you're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, and that's fine to forgive, but you also need to show them that you're living in sin and you need to live this way in order to get your goal, which is being with Yahweh in the end. So love is so much more than just, you know, a hug and a kiss. It's more than that. It's correction and it's learning to live accordingly and righteously, even if it hurts and even if it hurts to have the conversation with somebody. And it's awkward and it's uncomfortable, but love is sacrifice, so... That's good. That was good. And honestly, this eighth month is about that, where he is correcting us. There's a lot of correction because Sukkot was a wedding, but now the groom is coming to live with us in this eighth month. And there are things, patterns, and ways of acting in our lives that are coming to the surface because you, are, you had a person move in with you. We're running out of time, but I'll close with this thought. We had a person move in with us, basically. And there's bound to be things in our life that there's going to be conflict. And knowing that God still loves you is important. It does not feel like love all the time, but it is an ultimate act of love because it is commitment to the relationship. And that is why if you're going through some hard things right now, or you're having things in your life be brought to the surface, it's kind of okay. Surrender to the process. Surrender to the pain. It's okay. So, one last thing before I close. They're mad at me in the sound booth, but that's okay. Is, just a quick thought, is the word for ark in the Hebrew is teva. Teva is also the Hebrew word for word. Keep that in mind. Let me close with a blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has planted everlasting life in our midst. Amen. Amen. Okay.